Hello lovelies, how are you doing? I hope all goes well with you. This is Sona, your English teacher, and I am back. I'm back. I know, I know. I was gone for a long time, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, I'm going to tell you a brief story about what I've been through all these months. Um, the truth is, guys, uh, when I graduated from the university and I finished my bachelor's, I felt like I'm lost. I was chronically overwhelmed 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and uh, I didn't know which path I should take uh, or what I'm gonna do with the rest of my life, what I'm gonna do with my career, with my studies. Um, I don't know if any of you can relate this, but I was really stuck. I couldn't make a decision and I couldn't move an inch. So my mind was really, really chaotic and I seeked help from psychologists and counselors and um, now I've realized uh, what I'm gonna do with my life and with my career and uh, as a result I will be here with you guys and I will be creating videos for you constantly on a regular basis and I need your supports my friends I need your supports more than ever so please don't forget to hit the red subscribe button and yeah it's been a great chatting let's just start our lesson Today we're going to learn English with a very wonderful movie. Dungeons and Dragons. Satan's Game. Yes, as he said, Dungeons and Dragons. A charming thief and a band of unlikely adventurers embark on an epic quest to retrieve a lost relic. But things go dangerously awry when they run afoul of the wrong people. Now, let's watch the first scene. Oh, that's blistering. It's blisteringly hot. <laughs> Yet again. Kira, we really should speak to the kitchen staff. The tea is scorching. I do apologize. It's scorching hot. Um, Sophina, would you mind very much? Um... Certainly. Good. Thank you. I, I, I didn't realize you were going to put your finger in, in the cup, sir. I'm going to leave that for later. Oh my god, she put her finger in the cup. I love Safina in this movie. Um, she's a scary and at the same time very funny. Um, I don't think I would love her if she was in real world. Just in the movie, it's okay. Okay, uh, let's learn the first sentence. It's blisteringly hot. Blistering refers to something that is extremely hot or intense heat. He said the tea is blisteringly hot. Another similar sentence he used, it's a scorching hot. It's a scorching hot. Scorching also implies burning. It shows the discomfort and intensity of the temperature. So, blisteringly hot and scorching hot, they are both used to describe high temperatures. You might use these phrases in different situations. For example, uh, about weather descriptions, you might say, the desert was blisteringly hot. Or during summer days, you may say, um, we decided to stay indoors because it was blisteringly hot outside. Another example may be, the beach sand was scorching hot. You can also use them for cooking descriptions, like the pan was blisteringly hot. All right, let's watch the next scene. I told her the truth. I think she has a right to know it. <laughs> he's, he's been lying to you, Kira. I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to bring your mother back. Oh, Ed, come on. Look, I, I know how much you crave for forgiveness, but I promise you, more lies is not the way. You snake. I know how much you crave for forgiveness, but more lies is not the way. Crave for forgiveness. To crave for something expresses a strong desire or longing for something. 
It is commonly used to describe an irresistible desire for something specific. Let me give you an example sentence. After a long day of work, I craved for pasta. I mean, a large portion of pasta. In case you didn't know, I am in love. I'm addicted to pasta. Oh my god, just just look at it. How can I resist? Okay, let's let's continue. I, I'm gonna give you some other examples. During the diet, he constantly craved for chocolate, but resisted the temptation. Guys, be careful about the preposition. It's crave for. Okay, so let's see another example sentence. After weeks of travel, I crave for the familiar taste of home cooked meals. Another one. Pregnant women often experience cravings for unusual food combinations. Okay, let's watch the next scene. She's had years to resent you for your absence. And you've had years to poison her against me. <laughs> and now you're in the floor. All these years together, and you double crosses for this witch? Never put your trust in a con man. Okay, the first sentence is, you have poisoned her against me. To poison someone against someone else means to influence or to manipulate a person's opinions, feelings, or attitudes in a negative way towards another person. It's like trying to make one person dislike or distrust another person. For example, he tried to poison my friends against me by telling them untrue stories about my character. It's not healthy to poison your children against their other parent during a divorce. It only hurts them in the long run. Okay, the next sentence is, you double cross us for this witch. To double cross someone means to um, betray or deceive them especially after gaining their trust. So it involves breaking a promise or acting against someone in a harmful and dishonest way. I really hate this when people double cross you. I have my own motto, okay? I say, stay loyal or stay away from me, right? So let me give you example sentences. He double-crossed his business partner by secretly starting a competing company. She promised not to tell, but then double-crossed her friend by revealing the secret to everyone. Slightly blurry like this. Yeah. You want to be very blurry, but to be slightly blurry. He's nicking our bits and bobs! He's nicking our bits and bobs! Nicking bits and bobs means someone is stealing or taking some various items without permission. It's a nice expression you can use in your conversations. For example, I can't find my pen anywhere. I think someone has been nicking my bits and bobs from the desk. I caught my little brother nicking my bits and bobs in the kitchen, eating all the snacks. We have to be careful at the beach. There have been reports of people nicking tourists' bits and bobs. You know, there's rumors she made Lord never ever fall ill to clear the way for Forge. The magic is on a whole other level. Don't sell yourself short. We saw your show. Don't sell yourself short. Don't sell yourself short is an expression that advises someone not to underestimate or undervalue their abilities, their achievements, or worth. It encourages recognizing and acknowledging one's own capabilities and accomplishments. For example, when you're in the job interview, don't sell yourself short. Highlight your strengths and experiences confidently. Or, in salary negotiations, don't sell yourself short. Know your value and ask for what you deserve. When presenting your projects, don't sell yourself short. Emphasize the hard work and innovation you've put into it. 
Lord Neverember considered them quite brutal. Lord Neverember and I are very different men. For example, I prefer to be up and about. He prefers to be in a vegetative state. <laughs> <laughs> you are terrible. <laughs> I prefer to be up and about, and he prefers to be in a vegetative state. Let's analyze the first sentence. I prefer to be up and about. To be up and about、uh, means you want to be active and energetic. And moving around rather than being just sedentary and inactive, so it shows your desire to do physical activities. Okay, for example, after being sick for a week, I prefer to be up and about, taking a short walk and getting some fresh air. The next sentence is, he prefers to be in a vegetative state. To be in a vegetative state. Uh, refers to a severe medical condition when a person is alive but shows no signs of awareness and no responses. So, to be in a vegetative state or to vegetate means to live without doing any physical or mental activities. For instance, after the accident, John was in a vegetative state. He was unable to communicate or respond. Also, we can say that some elderly people are left alone in care homes and they just vegetate. Keep your guard up. I don't trust this guy. You know he's helping us.、Uh, he's got something up his sleeve. The only thing up my sleeve is my arm. How can you hear that? I hear that as well. I hate you. He's got something up his sleeve. He's got something up his sleeve. To have something up your sleeve is an idiom. It means that someone has a hidden strategy or plan, or the person is keeping something secret, or they are not revealing their full intentions at the moment. For instance, I wouldn't trust his innocent smile. I'm sure he's got something up his sleeve. She seems so calm. But I'm sure she has something up her sleeve for the upcoming meeting. Be cautious during negotiations. The other party might have something up their sleeve. That's a lot of pressure, given all we went through to get it. Yeah, I realize that. So entire fate rests on you. Our entire fate rests on you. If something rests on someone or something else, it means a significant outcome or responsibility depends on a person, thing, or factor. For example, the success of the project rests on the team's ability. The safety of the passengers rests on the pilot's skills. The game rests on the goalkeeper's ability to block shots. All right, thanks for listening. That wraps up today's video. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, and if you have questions, drop them in the comments. See you in the next video. Bye.